Good evening, students. This is Nicholas Hatcher, and I'm excited to be delivering this lecture to you all about laboratory and diagnostic analysis. The goal of this lecture is to provide you with an overview of common laboratory tests, as well as a basic overview of imaging studies that will help you build a foundation for further analysis of relevant labs in the following semesters. A good deal of information will be covered, but if you emphasize these four objectives, I'm confident that you'll do well in the exam. The objectives are as follows. Number one, explain the importance of laboratory tests and diagnostic imaging in clinical practice. Number two, discuss the correlation between laboratory tests and diagnostic imaging in the nursing process. Number three, identify common laboratory tests and apply laboratory tests to relevant body systems. Number four, explore the basics of diagnostic imaging and discuss relevant nursing actions for the patient requiring diagnostic imaging. Throughout this week and the next, you will be focusing on the nursing process as a framework for your practice as a registered nurse. In the introductory nursing process lecture, you will or have covered the concept of subjective versus objective data. In terms of assessment, subjective and objective data merge to create a full patient story. This, in essence, develops a big picture of the patient and his or her experience. Once this big picture has been established, it becomes much easier to further analyze the patient as well as the full clinical vignette. Labs and diagnostics contribute to your objective findings. Almost a century ago, a diagnosis was made almost entirely by clinical observation. Now, some diagnoses are still based on observation, whereas others rely on diagnostic and laboratory data. Laboratory tests can assist in establishing a diagnosis, determining a baseline before treatment, screen for modifiable risk factors, assist in maintaining therapeutic levels, for example with drugs, and can be used to evaluate the response to treatment regimens. The use of labs and diagnostics can be implemented throughout the entire nursing process. The use of labs supporting your assessment can assist in developing clusters of data that will help you formulate a nursing diagnosis. The use of labs can also help plan patient care. They can be used to answer questions such as, should I give this medication? What will this intervention change in the patient? And is this treatment necessary? The use of labs and diagnostics during evaluation will help you objectively determine whether or not the treatment has been effective. Let's begin by looking at laboratory tests that can be done on blood. When blood is drawn, either by you or a phlebotomist, it is collected in a container, called a vacutainer, of a specific color. The specific color is universal and correlates with particular studies. The difference in these containers is the medium inside the tube. The following are the most common vacutainers used in practice. The labs we will be discussing can be organized into what are referred to as fish bones. Fish bones are simply a method for organizing patient labs. The following are the six fish bones we will be exploring. The first laboratory test we will look at is the complete blood count, or CBC. The CBC provides information about the hematological and immune system, and its components include white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells. These categories are further broken down to include more data related to its parent class. The fish bone for a CBC represents a starting point for the most crucial components of the CBC. When one of these components is abnormal, further analysis is warranted. We will now look into each of these components in more detail. As you will recall from anatomy and physiology, there are five groups of white blood cells, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. A good way to remember the quantities of white blood cells is to remember, nobody likes my educational background and 60, 30, 6, 3, 1. These are the median quantities of each group of white blood cells. The starting point for analyzing white blood cells is the overall concentration of white blood cells. I'm sure you remember that white blood cells fight infection and react against foreign bodies and tissue. Using this knowledge, you can imagine why white blood cells would be elevated, such as with infection, trauma, stress, tissue necrosis, or inflammation. An individual may lack white blood cells in bone marrow failure because white blood cells are synthesized here. They may also be reduced in overwhelming infection because they're essentially wiped out. Or they may be decreased in dietary deficiency because they can't be made. Finally, white blood cells may be reduced in autoimmune disease because they're clustered at target tissues. 
Neutrophils are produced within 7 to 14 days following acute inflammation or bacterial infection. They primarily perform phagocytosis of foreign bodies or tissues. Neutrophils are often reduced in overwhelming bacterial infection and immunosuppression, where the immune system is essentially weakened or overwhelmed. The lymphocytes include mature T cells from cellular immunity and B cells. Lymphocytes are increased in chronic and viral infections as well as with leukemia and Hodgkin's disease. Lymphocytes are again decreased in bone marrow suppression and immunodeficiency or immunosuppression. Anytime you hear of steroids, think immunosuppression. Monocytes are phagocytic cells that are precursors to macrophages. They are capable of fighting organisms much like neutrophils but are produced more rapidly and last longer. Monocytes may be elevated especially in viral and parasitic infections as well as in chronic inflammatory diseases. Monocytes are especially decreased in the presence of glucocorticoids which function much like steroids. Eosinophils are capable of phagocytosis of antigen antibody complexes in allergic reactions and parasitic infections. Just like the previous white blood cells, they are decreased in the presence of steroids. All inflammation is associated with mast cell degranulation. Basophils, or mast cells, are small cells found everywhere in the body and contain granules filled with pro-inflammatory mediators. In the presence of stress and hyperthyroidism, mast cells can be reduced. We will now look at the other side of the CBC fishbone and discuss platelets. Platelets normally range from 150 to 400,000 per millimeters cube. Platelets are essential to blood clotting, and when they're in low quantity, you'll have an increase in bleeding chance, whereas when they're in high concentration, you'll have increased clotting. Most commonly, you'll find these in low quantities rather than high. Thrombocytopenia can occur when platelets are destroyed, not produced, diluted, sequestered, or lost. Now we will look at red blood cells and associated labs. Red blood cells are synthesized in the bone marrow and primarily function in oxygen transport. They live for approximately 120 days. A high red blood cell count can be found when the body requires a greater degree of oxygen carrying capacity, such as with a high altitude, and also in diseases that produce chronic hypoxia, such as with heart disease. Red blood cells can be low in hemorrhage, for example with GI bleeds and trauma, hemolysis, which can happen with splenomegaly, dietary deficiency, such as with iron and B12 deficiencies, genetic diseases such as sickle cell anemia and thalassemia, drug ingestion, such as with chloramphenicol and quinidine, bone marrow failure, which can occur with fibrosis, leukemia, and chemo, chronic illness, such as with tumors and sepsis, and organ failure, especially with the kidneys. Hemoglobin, found within the red blood cells, serves as a vehicle for oxygen and carbon dioxide transport. Hemoglobin may be increased when it's concentrated, as with dehydration. You may also have an excess of hemoglobin when there's an excess of red blood cells, as with polycythemia vera or hemoglobin might be elevated when you need more oxygen carrying capacity, as with COPD or congestive heart failure and high altitude. Hemoglobin is decreased especially with anemias, hemorrhage, and renal disease. In this test tube, I divided the total blood volume into its parts. Hematocrit looks at the percentage of the total blood volume made up by red blood cells. You will find hematocrit to be elevated in the same conditions as with hemoglobin and is likewise decreased by similar causes. The mean corpuscular volume, or MCV, measures the average volume or size of a single red blood cell expressed as normocytic, microcytic, or macrocytic. A macrocytic, or large red blood cell, can be found in alcohol abuse, B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency, liver disease, and hypothyroidism. Microcytic cells can be found in iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic disease, thalassemia, sideroblastic anemia, and chronic renal failure. The mean corpuscular hemoglobin, or MCH, is a measurement of the average amount or weight of hemoglobin within a red blood cell. Microcytic cells have less hemoglobin 
whereas macrocytic cells have more hemoglobin. The causes of alterations in MCH closely resemble the mean corpuscular volume. You'll find an increase in MCH in macrocytic anemia and a decrease in microcytic anemia as well as hypochromic anemia, which we'll discuss next. The mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, or MCHC, is a measurement of the average concentration or percentage of hemoglobin within a single red blood cell. Red blood cells are either considered normal chromic or hypochromic, and it's because only 37 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin can fit in a red blood cell that they cannot be considered hyperchromic. Cells are considered hypochromic with a decreased MCHC in iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia, and lead poisoning. The red blood cell distribution width, or RDW, measures variation in red blood cell size. Aneocytosis is a term used to describe variable and abnormal red blood cell sizes. The RDW can be increased in iron deficiency, B12, or folate deficiency, in hemoglobinopathies such as sickle cell anemia, and post-hemorrhagic anemias. Let's review. Which of the following labs are abnormal and what are the implications for the abnormal value? You may want to pause the lecture to think about your answer. In this case, the hemoglobin and hematocrit are decreased, which suggests that there's an underlying anemia. This would then warrant further investigation into the other red blood cell related labs. As I mentioned, your fish bones represent a starting point for further analysis. What about with this case? In this case, the white blood cells are elevated, suggesting an underlying infection or inflammation. This would then warrant further investigation into the white blood cell subtypes. Next, we will discuss the basic metabolic panel. The basic metabolic panel looks at the electrolytes sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. It also looks at acid-base balance with carbon dioxide. In addition, the basic metabolic panel provides information about the kidneys. And it also sheds light on metabolism or the endocrine system with blood glucose. This is the fishbone most commonly used for the basic metabolic panel. I won't go into too much detail with the electrolytes because you'll have a lecture later in the semester focusing on fluid and electrolyte balance, but I would like to share the complete fishbone. Sodium is the major cation in the extracellular fluid and is regulated by aldosterone and natriuretic peptides. Sodium functions in neuromuscular activity, regulation of acid-base balance, as with sodium bicarbonate, it functions in cellular chemical reactions and also transports substances across membranes. Sodium can be increased with increased sodium intake, decreased sodium loss, as with Cushing's disease or hyperaldosteronism, or excessive free body water loss, as with diabetes insipidus, diaphoresis or sweating, and burns. An individual's sodium can be low whenever they have inadequate intake. There's increased sodium loss, as with diarrhea, emesis, and diuretics. An increase in free body water, as with congestive heart failure, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, or SIADH, or excessive water intake. It can also be low with third space losses of sodium, as with ascites, peripheral edema, and pleural effusion. Potassium is the major intracellular electrolyte. It's regulated by aldosterone, sodium resorption, insulin, epinephrine, and alkalosis. Potassium functions in fluid balance, electrical neutrality, and also a variety of metabolic functions. An individual's potassium can be elevated in acute or chronic renal disease, crush injuries and hemolysis, acidosis, and dehydration. Potassium can be decreased in burns, diarrhea, vomiting, diuretics, and glucose administration. Chloride is the most abundant anion in the extracellular fluid. It closely and passively follows sodium. Chloride primarily functions to provide electroneutrality, 
Chloride can be elevated in dehydration, excessive infusion, Cushing syndrome, kidney dysfunction, metabolic acidosis, and respiratory alkalosis. Chloride can be decreased in overhydration, CHF or SIADH, vomiting, gastric suctioning, burns, metabolic alkalosis, diuretics, and respiratory acidosis. Bicarbonate is represented in a metabolic panel as CO2. The CO2 on a BMP reflects carbonic acid, dissolved carbon dioxide, and the bicarbonate ion that exists in venous blood. Because carbonic acid content in the venous blood is small, this is actually an indirect measurement of bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is the second most important anion that acts as a buffer. Bicarbonate can be increased when there is a loss of acid to bind to, as with some of these examples. It can be decreased when there's an excess of acid to bind to. Urea is formed in the liver as an end product of protein metabolism. So basically, protein is broken down into amino acids, which then moves to the liver and is converted to ammonia, which is then converted into urea, which is ultimately excreted by the kidneys. The blood urea nitrogen is directly related to the metabolic function of the liver, as well as the excretory function of the kidneys. Blood urea nitrogen is often increased in conditions involving the kidneys. These conditions are broken down based on where they occur. Prerenal is before the kidneys. Renal is within the kidneys and postrenal is after the kidneys. The BUN can also be elevated in dehydration. The blood urea nitrogen may be decreased in liver failure, overhydration, a negative nitrogen balance, which essentially refers to protein malnutrition, and nephrotic syndrome. Creatinine is the catabolic product of creatine phosphate, which is used in skeletal muscle contraction. An individual's serum creatinine will fluctuate some with muscle mass differences. Because creatinine is excreted entirely by the kidneys, it is therefore directly proportional to renal excretory function. Because creatinine is directly proportional to excretory function, only conditions affecting the kidneys will increase serum creatinine. With decreased muscle mass or debilitation, serum creatinine may be decreased. The final component we will discuss from the basic metabolic panel is the blood glucose. Blood glucose is controlled by insulin, which decreases glucose whenever it's elevated, and glucagon, which increases glucose when it's decreased. Diabetes mellitus is the most common cause of an elevated blood glucose, but there are a variety of causes that increase or decrease blood glucose. An additional lab I would like to discuss associated with diabetes is the hemoglobin A1c. 98% of hemoglobin in red blood cells is hemoglobin A. Through a process referred to as glycosylation, hemoglobin binds strongly with glucose. This glucose remains attached for the lifespan of the red blood cell, which is 120 days. Therefore, the hemoglobin A1c reflects long-term glucose control. Here I've provided you a chart just for your reference. Let's review. Which of the following lab values are abnormal and what are the implications for the abnormal value? In this case, the blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine are elevated, suggesting that something may be wrong with the kidneys. Here are some additional electrolytes and their fishbone representation. I will be intentionally skipping these because you'll have a fluid and electrolyte lecture later in the semester. Let's now discuss coagulation studies. The first coagulation study we'll discuss is the prothrombin time, or PT. The PT is used to evaluate the extrinsic system and the common pathway and the clotting mechanism. It measures factors 1, 2, 5, 7, and 10. When these clotting factors are deficient, the PT will be prolonged. Don't try to memorize these steps for your exam. This is only meant to be a refresher as well as to show you how this works. The intrinsic pathway is activated by damage to the surface of the endothelium of blood vessels. The extrinsic pathway is activated by tissue trauma. These two pathways merge at activated factor X, forming the common pathway. A few steps later, a fibrin clot is formed. Of these factors, 1, 2, 5, 7, and 10 
are produced by the liver. Therefore, liver disease will decrease the quantity of these factors, prolonging the prothrombin time. On the other hand, factors 2, 4, 5, and 7 are dependent on vitamin K. So if the patient has reduced bile, which is responsible for fat metabolism, these factors will be decreased. Coumadin additionally targets vitamin K dependent factors. Both of these cases will increase the PT. The International Normalized Ratio, or INR, is a uniform version of the PT. I've provided a chart here for your reference showing the preferred INR for its associated indication. The partial thromboplastin time, or PTT, is used to assess the intrinsic system and the common pathway. It evaluates factors 1, 2, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. When these factors are low in quantity, the PTT is prolonged. Here is a visual representation of where these factors are in the cascade. Most commonly, you will find the PTT to be elevated, especially in heparin administration, vitamin K deficiency, and cirrhosis of the liver. Let's review. Which of the following labs will be elevated if the patient is on warfarin? What about on heparin? In the patient who's on warfarin, the PT and INR will be elevated. Most clinicians focus on the INR. In the patient who's on heparin, the PTT will be elevated. Next, we will discuss cardiovascular labs. Here I've provided you with a table of the cardiac enzymes as well as some additional data regarding each. The cardiac enzymes include two variations of creatine kinase, MB, and two variations of troponin. Note that troponin 1 is the most specific to myocardial injury, whereas the others may elevate with other pathologies. The reason some clinicians also use CKMB is to narrow down the time frame. These labs are particularly useful in determining myocardial ischemia and infarction. The last cardiac lab that I will introduce you to is the brain natriuretic peptide, or BNP. Here is a simple diagram of the heart showing the right and left sides, and here is the left ventricle. When the left ventricle is stretched from within the ventricle, BNP is released. BNP opposes the function of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, resulting in vessel relaxation, inhibition of aldosterone and renin, and an increase in naturesis and a decrease in blood volume. Naturesis, when broken down, means sodium diuresis, so basically the individual will lose sodium. Water always follows sodium, so the primary function of BNP then is to dump sodium in water. You will find an elevated BNP in congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, and hypertension. Next we will discuss pulmonary labs. The only pulmonary lab we will be discussing is the arterial blood gas. The difference between an arterial blood gas and other labs is that the ABG comes from an artery rather than a vein. A special technique performed by a respiratory therapist and occasionally a nurse depending on state practice laws is required to obtain arterial blood. An ABG provides you with information about the patient's acid-base status. When the pH is high, we know that the patient is alkalotic. When the pH is low, we know that the patient is acidotic. The remaining values in an ABG will tell you whether or not the patient is experiencing a respiratory versus a metabolic condition. The PaCO2 primarily looks at respiratory conditions, and whenever it's high, the patient's acidotic and in respiratory acidosis. Whenever it's low, the patient's in respiratory alkalosis. The PaO2 is simply the amount of oxygen in arterial blood. The bicarbonate, or HCO3 minus, will shed light into metabolic conditions. When the bicarb is elevated, the patient's noted to be in metabolic alkalosis. When the bicarb is low, the patient's in metabolic acidosis. The base deficit looks at whether there is a lack or excess of base in the blood. And finally, the SAO2 correlates with the SpO2, or the oxygen saturation, in a patient. Now we will move on to gastrointestinal labs. For the gastrointestinal labs, I'll draw your attention to the Complete Metabolic Panel, or CMP.
This includes all of the components of the basic metabolic panel, plus liver function tests, or LFTs, albumin, and total protein. The first liver function test is aspartate aminotransferase, also known as aspartate transaminase. This lab can shed light on the patient with a potential liver problem. Note, however, that AST is also elevated in skeletal muscle diseases. A good way to remember this is by correlating the S and AST to skeletal muscle. Alanine aminotransferase, also known as alanine transaminase, is found predominantly in the liver. Lesser quantities are found in the kidneys, heart, and skeletal muscle, but compared to AST, this lab is more specific to the liver. A good way to remember this is correlating the L and ALT with liver. Alkaline phosphatase, or ALP, is found in highest concentration in the liver, biliary tract epithelium, and bone. ALP is present in the Kupfer cells that line the biliary collecting system and liver and excrete it into bile. ALP also tends to elevate with new bone growth. Based on this knowledge, you can see why ALP is elevated in conditions such as cirrhosis, biliary obstruction, liver and bone malignancy, osteomalacia, and rickets. A low ALP is not as common, but can be seen in the conditions that I've listed for you. Before discussing alterations in bilirubin, let's review where bilirubin comes from. The hemoglobin from a red blood cell is broken down into globin and heme. Heme is broken down further into biliverdin. Biliverdin is converted then to indirect bilirubin or unconjugated bilirubin. This then moves to the liver where it's converted into direct bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin. At this point, bilirubin enters the bile duct and is converted into urobilinogen, which is both released in stool and urine. An increase in conjugated bilirubin can be found in gallstones, extrahepatic duct obstruction, extensive liver metastasis, and drug-induced cholestasis. An increase in unconjugated bilirubin can be found in hemolytic jaundice, large volume blood transfusion, hepatitis, sepsis, hemolytic anemia, cirrhosis, and sickle cell anemia. Proteins are constituents of muscle, enzymes, hormones, transport vehicles, hemoglobin, and other key structural components. They are key in maintaining oncotic pressure, which is the pulling force acting to pull fluid into an area. Total protein can be broken down into globulin and albumin. For the purpose of this lecture, we'll only discuss albumin. The total protein can be decreased in liver disease and malnutrition. Albumin is notably the most important protein in the body. It is formed within the liver and therefore is a good assessment of liver function. It makes up approximately 60% of the total protein. Albumin has a variety of functions, but primarily maintains oncotic pressure and functions as a transporter. You may find albumin to be increased in dehydration and decreased in malnutrition, liver disease, overhydration, and protein-losing GI and renal disease. A decrease in albumin suggests chronic liver disease because the half-life of albumin is about 20 days. One additional GI lab that's not listed here is the prothrombin time, or PT. The PT is actually considered the best indicator of acute liver injury because clotting factors are synthesized by the liver. Amylase is secreted from pancreatic cells into the duodenum and aids in carbohydrate catabolism. Because of this, amylase assesses pancreatic function. It rises within 12 hours of disease onset and lasts 48 to 72 hours. Lipase is also secreted by the pancreas into the duodenum. It functions to break down triglycerides into fatty acids. Because lipase is only synthesized by the pancreas, it is considered more specific than amylase. However, it increases 24 to 48 hours after disease onset and remains elevated for 5 to 7 days. At this point, we've covered a lot of blood tests and there are many more that you will learn as you progress. Listed here are the fish bones for most of the labs we covered. Please note that I am not expecting you to memorize the numeric ranges for each of the provided labs. The purpose of this lecture is to build a foundation for your objective assessment of the patient 
as well as give you a starting point and reference for laboratory analysis. I do want you to understand what labs correspond with what system, as well as a general idea of what the implications are for an elevated or decreased lab. That being said, we'll move forward and look at urine-related labs. The most common urine lab is the urinalysis, and I will highlight a few notable concepts regarding the UA. Urine is usually clear with an amber to yellow color to it and is often described as aromatic. The pH has a relatively wide range. An elevation in protein can suggest glomerular disease or nephrotic syndrome. Leukocyte esterase, nitrites, white blood cells, and white blood cell casts all suggest infection. Ketones are often noted in diabetic ketoacidosis and starvation. Glucose is usually found in the urine with uncontrolled diabetes. In this final section, I'll briefly discuss diagnostic imaging. Radiologic tests can range from a simple chest x-ray to a complex cardiac catheterization. Assess the patient for similar or recent tests because overexposure to radiation can be problematic. If the patient will receive contrast, assess the patient for an allergy to iodine and also assess the patient for renal disease with their BUN and creatinine, as well as diabetes, because these individuals are at particular risk for contrast-induced kidney injury. You'll want to observe the patient for a delayed reaction to dye, which manifests as dyspnea or shortness of breath, a rash, tachycardia, and hives within two to six hours following contrast exposure. It is important to remove metal objects in patients going for an MRI, as well as to assess for implanted metal devices such as surgical hardware or a pacemaker because an MRI can result in heating of implanted metals and can cause pacemaker malfunction. Nuclear scanning involves the administration of a radionucleotide and subsequent detection of a particular organ. Note recent exposure to radionucleotides as this can cause interference with imaging. Also assess the patient's age and weight because weight-based dosing is used. Nuclear scanning is contraindicated in pregnancy and the patient must be able to lie still for the scan. With ultrasound, harmless high-frequency sound waves are emitted that penetrate the organ being studied. An ultrasound can be performed at the bedside or in radiology. There is no radiation risk and this can be repeated without risk of harm. Next, we will discuss the most common invasive diagnostic test. Endoscopy, is an invasive diagnostic procedure that allows for direct visualization through a lighted flexible tube. For these procedures, patient must remain NPO for 8 to 12 hours to prevent aspiration. It's important to schedule endoscopy prior to barium studies, which you'll go into a little bit more detail on that in your GI lectures. Of course, you need to obtain informed consent, and this procedure can be performed at the bedside, in the procedure room, or the operating room. The air that can be instilled into the bowel by endoscopy can cause gas pain. And in addition to this being diagnostic, procedures can be performed such as biopsies and stent placement. This concludes this lecture on laboratory and diagnostic analysis. In your handout, I provided you with a few examples of useful apps that you can use in clinical practice at the discretion of your clinical instructor and facility. I've also posted a quick reference guide to laboratory tests as well as a case study. The case study is not required for a grade, but will help you apply the content of this lecture in practice. I hope this information serves as a solid foundation for laboratory and diagnostic analysis. If you have additional questions, feel free to email me at nshatcher at gmail.com.